good. It's bigger. All right. oh. um, I forgot one announcement. Sorry about that. The uh, flowers on the altar today are donated by Ronnie and Francis in honor of Ronnie's mother, Mary. So the first reading today is <clears throat> from 1 Corinthians chapter 29, verses 6 through 18. Then the leaders of ancestral houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of the thousands and of the hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because these had been given willingly for with single mind they had offered freely to the Lord. King David also rejoiced greatly. Then David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, are the greatest greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. And now, our God, we give thanks to you and praise your glorious name. But who am I? What, sorry, and what is my people that we should be able to make this free will offering for all things come from you and of your own <clears throat> have we given you? For we are aliens and transients before you, as were all our ancestors. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. O oh, Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your, your own. I know, my God, that you search the heart and take pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our ancestors. Keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts towards you. The second reading is from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. <clears throat> for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God's word for God's people. And our lives respond. Oh, don't mute me. I'm supposed to be unmuted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, having our lives respond to those calls to know ourselves so amazingly beloved of God is it's hard to take that all in. You know, in the lectionary, for preachers who always use the lectionary, uh, they would never preach on this apart from First Chronicles because the entire book of First Chronicles is completely not in the lectionary, doesn't appear at all. But I love this one that I shared today because King David is talking about First of all, before this, he's talking about all the things he's set aside to build the temple for God. And oh my goodness, he's been collecting and collecting and stockpiling everything needed. But then he realizes more than just what he has to give is needed. 
To build a temple for God, you need God's people all joined to the task. And so he gives all the families an opportunity to join in the giving. And that passage is kind of mind boggling because you don't have people say, oh, rats, do they want 10%? Does it have to be 10%? Was that net or gross? People aren't saying, well, I don't know, this has been a tough year. What happens is people are pouring and pouring out offerings in a way that is mind boggling. And they're doing it because they're so grateful for God. And David in his prayer really acknowledges the gratitude. He points out that I feel really small even offering you these things and our people even offering it to you because everything we have, God, comes from you. You know, when our kids were little, their schools would have a special, uh, it was a fundraiser, but they had these little things. Um, and you'd send your kid to school with $5, $10 if you wanted a really hot present, right? And you'd send your kid to school with some money and they'd go to this bazaar and they'd choose something to, and the teachers would help them wrap it up and they'd wrap it up and they'd have a present to bring home to their parents. I still have the... Uh, I don't know what it's made of, some sort of ceramic-y thing with a family of snow people clustered around. You put a votive candle in the center. And I always thought a suicidal family of snowmen is not a happy image. But, but Hannah loved it. And so we loved it so much. We still cherish it. And I try to think of it in the light in which it was given, but it cracks me up year after year. But it's kind of like that with God, because everything we have that we give to God came from God. Part of our worship is acknowledging that. And there's, of course, money that we use to maintain a building so that we can come together in worship and so that the Zoom people can finally see something other than the back wall in my dining room. And so we do that to maintain our church home, but it's so much more than that. When we give to God, we give money for things like Beatitude Health, which provides health care to people who may be even homeless and have absolutely nothing or maybe are the working poor and cannot afford health care. And Larry Nance shows up week after week to minister to people at for no cost whatsoever to them who have health care needs. And she comes to the Colors of Hunger meal where John and Donnie and all the folks, I'm looking around at people who pitch in and help with that all the time, put out food, healthy food, wonderful meals. And that's not enough. You know, you got the letter saying we need bug spray, we need shorts, we figure out clothing needs. And if you live in the woods, you always need bug spray. So there's a huge need for that. So we find ways to give the things and when we can, and so many of us have hearts that are so open to following through with time. You know, we've been asking folks, you noticed when you came in this morning, there are some people who greet you, make sure you're on the list for vaccination cards, because it is true, those COVID cases are spiking again. But one thing we do here is that if you're hanging out indoors with only people who are vaccinated, that's pretty darn safe. And so we thank God that we had an opportunity to get vaccinated, but we have people to make sure, okay, we've got those cards and welcome you and help you come in, but we need people to do that. We can't just have a couple people helping with that. So if your heart calls you, to serve and worship by 
it's not a hard job. You've got to be friendly when somebody comes in the door. You have to smile and say, hi, you can look on the list. That's not wicked hard. And if they're not on the list, you can explain about, well, we need the card because we're trying not to kill people in worship. And uh, if they don't have a card yet because they're not vaccinated, then you can tell them how important it is to include them in worship. And so make sure they know how to do it through Zoom and tell them to come back as soon as they can get vaccinated. I'll help you with that after worship today. If you can stay for a minute and you'd like to be part of that ministry, which really is sacred ministry. We wanna make sure that people come through the door and know by God, by God, we're glad they're here and they're welcome here. So if you'd like to join that ministry, we encourage you to do that. There are so many ways that this church has for us to reach out and make a difference like cards. Don't forget those cards are waiting for you after worship. You can pick up one, two. Heck, if you think you'll use them, you take six, okay? Um, just leave one googly eye one because I am going to try really hard to send Journey a googly eye thank you card for being so faithful in children's time. Um, but there are ways that we can follow through. And when David was praying, did you catch that bit at the end? Because we've got to pray for one another, this prayer all the time. David asked God to keep our hearts full of these purposes and thoughts. And God, keep our hearts turned toward you. David doesn't say, okay, we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we're going to work harder to keep our heart on God. He knows better. He says, God, please help us keep your thoughts and purposes. This Ooh, I... level of dedication and caring, keep it alive oh, really? in our hearts. And yeah, God, please keep turning our hearts to you because the only way our hearts get to God is through God. St. Paul was writing about that too. I should have included verse five. We started with verse six. Verse five talks about God always pouring God's love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Pouring God doesn't dust our hearts with a little smattering of love. God doesn't drizzle some love over our hearts, put a few dabs on it. No way. God pours love, pours it right in and through us. Some of us understand really well about love that's just poured in. I share every time we talk about love, I talk about my grandmother who had only, she was an orphan. And so when she married my grandfather, finally she was going to have a family. She had two sons, one of them eight years older than my dad got married and he and his wife did not want kids. My grandmother was beside herself. And my dad was 30 and he wasn't married yet. And my grandmother took action. Um, she said, why don't you invite that nice Joan Weller over? Because they've been exchanging letters after they met in World War II. She was British for eight years. I always heard as a kid that my parents knew each other eight years before they were married. It was a great, inspiring story until I figured out they knew each other for approximately two weeks before he got shipped over to, Europe, to Germany. And after that, he didn't get to see her. When he got back, they wrote letters for eight years. And when she finally came over to this country, it took him under a week to decide to get married. So much for the eight year story. But my grandmother had prospects. She was desperate for grandchildren. And she was so good to my mom. She loved my mom when they got married. She said, Joan, if he gives you any trouble at all, come back to me. And uh, my dad always said, and she meant it. Um, 
So when I was born, the first grandchild, my grandmother was in heaven. My mom said when they went to visit for the first time, here she had little baby Diane in her arms with a blanket, and she was all ready to, you know, lovingly show me to her mother-in-law. And my mother said, no sooner did I get out of the car when your grandmother came hurtling down the hill, snatched you out of my arms saying, give me that baby. <laughs> and my grandmother poured love in and through me every, we lived right next door. So she had lots of opportunity and uh, poured love into me. So when I heard about God loving me, I figured I know that. God is like my grandmother. So I was ready to receive all that love from God. Some people have a harder time with that because they did not get, some people I found out in school, I was horrified. They had grandparents who said, no, I don't know what you do with a grandparent who says, no, I really don't. Um, but, and some grandparents who didn't say, oh, you want to eat all the rest of the frosting in the frosting bowl? Well, try not to get sick. And I never got sick. But I understand about love. And for many of us, maybe it wasn't our grandparent. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. My son, Adam, used to have a third grade Sunday school teacher that he loved beyond measure. She made him memorize Bible verses and would tell him Bible stories. And he explained all about her to me. He said, mom, she's really boring, but she really loves us. And, and she was a very boring teacher, but she loved those kids so much. They didn't care because it didn't matter really what she was teaching. What they were learning is that they were loved. One of the things God does when love gets poured into our hearts is it gives us an opportunity to share love. If anything ever gives us a glimmer, like if Lyle runs up and hugs you around the knee, you've got to know you're loved. You got to feel that. And if you feel that, then there's got to be some way you can reach out to someone else to let them know that they matter. You'll hear people say all the time, and I want to throw up every time I hear it, uh, well, have you taken Jesus as your own personal savior? I feel like they've got plastic bobblehead Jesuses on their mantles or something because they took Jesus as their own personal savior. Well, by God, we don't get to take God we don't make some great intellectual decision that we're going to belong to God. No, God says, I choose you, you personally, you as my own precious child. God, God takes us as a God's own personal child. God pours love into our hearts. God pours love and proved God's love for us because as the passage we read from Romans says, we've been reconciled to God, to all of God, to God's infinite love through Christ. Now, when push came to shove, we have got to notice that Christ did neither. Christ could have raised an army. God could have said, that's enough of this earth. Beam me up, Scotty, and just left. There were options. But God chose to live among us as a human being with all the risks, with all the scary stuff, with all the mean, unfair accusations that can be launched, with the risk and the actuality of death. And Christ says yes to that because of the love that is being poured into our hearts. We have to know that God would stop short of nothing, 
nothing to make sure we, each one of us, could get it, no matter what mean siblings might have said, no matter what a parent who wrestled with addiction might have said or done or not done, no matter what mean kids at school said to us for years, no matter how many times we felt we had to hide who we were because our neighbors or even people we sat beside in church were saying to us, well, that's not right. No matter how many times those things happened, God, God's self is pouring love in and through us. It's going to leak out. People are going to notice it. They will see that you are a child of God. And if you think, well, how? What's my purpose? What can I do? Ask me after worship. I have lots of ideas. God will keep nudging your heart. That's the thing. It's always an inside job. Receiving love, sharing love, daring to be loved is God's work. And we get to be taken as God's own personal child every minute of every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>